all those songs memorized and sounded really nice. Very nice singing. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to come preach today. And uh, Jerry let me know, I think it was on the 4th of July, that I'd be here. So I've had a lot of time to think about it. And this isn't a message that is very popular. But I trust that as a body of believers that we can embrace what Scripture says. Uh, We'll be in Romans chapter 1. Looking into verses 18 through 32. Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32. And as we look into this section of Scripture, I want us to contemplate an attribute of God that isn't necessarily elaborated as much today as it has been in the past. And this is, this passage here is sort of an explanation of God's holiness with His wrath. God's wrath with representing God's holiness. It, It separates Him from everything else in this world. He is, He is nothing like anything in this world best I'll I'll do my best to uh, explain God's holiness Uh, scripture has it right here in black and white what God is doing and and what we should expect Before we dig into this, please let us go before his throne. Father God, as we open your word today, we ask that you would help us to see your holiness to the best of our abilities. We ask that you would open our hearts and open our minds open our ears so that we could hear, think, and draw closer to you and knowing more about you and how we should expect one another and ourselves, how how we should expect, how I should expect myself to respond in the world today. Please give us strength and courage to stand up for what is right and to continue believing in your Son, Jesus Christ. And now we ask that you would continue to be with Pastor and his wife and family as they travel back. And please bring them back safely. And again, thank you for providing me with the opportunity to come share your word today. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32. Uh, I want to give a, uh, a little brief explanation of where Paul is in, in writing this letter. He, he never was... Um, he, he wanted to be with the, with the cr- uh, church in Rome... But he, he wrote this letter to them, and he had just explained the whole, let's, let's go to verses 16 and 17, and he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it... The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, but the righteous man 
shall live by faith. And so he's, he's diving into this whole explanation of the gospel. The gospel is the power of God for salvation, for, for the salvation of our sins. And we're going to be looking at a, a, a list of sins. And, and when we get to these sins... Please don't think that I'm, I'm drilling down on people for their lifestyles because I am just as, as sinful, or I was, I'm sorry, I was just as sinful before God saved me. I still sin, but it's a totally different mindset. It's, it's, it's an, not what I want to do. It's, there, there is repentance followed by sin. And so that is the difference between living before a relationship with Jesus Christ and living after that transformation. Let's look at verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. We're going to stop right there for just a moment. I'm going to borrow from John MacArthur in, in the footnotes here. And he explains this well. It, it's, it's being broken down into certain categories. So bear with me for just a moment. I want to share what he has to say. He says that this wrath that God is demonstrating, the wrath of God, is not an impulsive outburst of anger aimed capriciously at people whom God does not like. Okay, so, so let's think about that for a minute. This is not an impulsive outburst of anger aimed capriciously at people that God does not like. So that would be a, a, a wrong way of thinking about God's wrath. Say, you know, you, you pull out onto the interstate or something, or, you know, you, you come to a four-way stop and somebody doesn't go, or, or somebody is, is, you're there first, somebody starts driving through the intersection when it's not their turn. You lay on the horn, you, you wave at them, say it was my turn. That's an, that's an outburst of anger, and whether or not you like the person, that, that's not what, how God is demonstrating, that's not how God demonstrates his wrath. It says, uh, MacArthur goes on to say that it is the settled, determined response of a righteous God against sin. So if God is righteous, and he is, then that means he cannot do anything wrong. He, he has a, a determined anger towards sin based on who he is. He is perfect and holy. And so sin has to receive wrath. If, he, if sin did not receive wrath, he would not be holy. And he goes on to say more accurately... And is revealed, when it, when it says that God's wrath is revealed, it means it, it is constantly revealed. The word essentially means to uncover or make visible or make known. God reveals his wrath in two ways. Indirectly, through the natural consequences of violating his universal moral law. Or two, directly, through his personal intervention Example would be from the sen sentence passed on Adam and Eve to the worldwide flood, from the fire and brimstone that leveled Sodom to the Babylonian captivity. These all clearly display this kind of intervention. And he states, the most graphic revelation of God's holy wrath and hatred against sin was when he poured out divine judgment on his son on the cross. God has 
five in this. God has five various kinds of wrath, and I'll go through this quickly. One, eternal wrath, which is hell. Two, eschatological wrath, which means the, like the, the end times, uh, which is the final day of the Lord. Three, cataclysmic wrath, which is like the flood, the great flood, and the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Four, consequential wrath, which is the principle of sowing and reaping. And five, which is what we're going to be looking at today, is the wrath of abandonment, which is removing restraint and letting people go to their sins. And he says that here it is, that fifth form, God's abandoning the wicked continually through history to pursue their sin and its consequences. We can see that today. We can see how God is removing his grace, and we've been seeing it for a long time, how God has been removing his grace and allowing people to continue after their sin. They're chasing their sin. It's mind-blowing that the way that sin and temptation completely consume a person. Every ounce of a person is consumed with their sin and temptation. And without Jesus Christ, without the saving grace of God, we would all be chasing after our sin and, and be slaves to that sin. So what, what Paul states is that, by, in, in inspired by the Holy Spirit, that, that the unrighteousness, let's look at verse 18 again, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven, it's being made known against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Suppressing the truth means that they're, they are getting the truth out of their minds, out of their hearts, and they're, suppress, they're, they're suppressing the truth. They're, they're pushing down unrighteousness. They're using unrighteousness to fill their bodies so that they can get that truth out. They don't want the truth. in. They, they want to believe what they want to believe. And so there is no, they make no room for the truth. Verse 19, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. How did God make it evident to them? Well, he created us. He created the world. He has demonstrated his Ability to be the Almighty, be Almighty God, and in, in speaking everything into existence. So, for those who would not believe that God is the Almighty Creator, would be believing a lie, suppressing the truth by consuming themselves with a lie, and saying no. It happened scientifically. The, the, the matter uh, exploded in the Big Bang Theory. Well, how did it get there? If, if you want to go down that route of, of the Big Bang Theory, how did it get there? Something had to exist first to put it there. Verse 20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, and if you wanted to do a theological study on his invisible attributes, there's, there's some great, great material out there. Uh, I would recommend, his name just slipped my mind. I'll think about that in just a minute. Um, I'll think about his, I'll, let, me, let me think about his name. I've, I've studied his, his uh, podcasts, and, and it's very, very good. Uh, his, invisible, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through that, through what has been made so that we are without excuse. 
So as we are sitting here today, if we had not previously been saved by God's grace, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we are without excuse. And we are, we are more without excuse than those who have not heard the gospel. Because we, we hear it and, and we know, we know how to be saved. Verse 21. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. And there we have an example of God's wrath being revealed. Their foolish heart was darkened. Why? Well, they, even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and, and that is how their foolish hearts were darkened. And speculations would, would, would mean, you know, I don't really know how it happened, but I'm going to go ahead and believe what I hear. And that's, that's since, you know, it's, it's me, it's my life, I can believe whatever I want. So if it's speculation, so be it. I'm going to go ahead and believe that. And they continue to believe that. And their foolish hearts become darkened. Verse 22. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Thinking they were smart, they became, they, they're, they're continuing to, to go the opposite direction, and, and they're becoming more foolish. In exchange, the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed creatures and crawling creatures. So it might might say animals and and, and the the NASB puts it that that incorruptible man in the form of incorruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. So they're worshiping the creation rather than the creator. They're exchanging the glory of the incorruptible God, a God that cannot be corrupted. There is no sin. God cannot take part in any sin. He is incorruptible. There is nothing, nothing that can corrupt God. Now, I'm going to be a little bit more careful through this this section here. Verse 24 just because there's little ears in the room, okay? Therefore, God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. I've I, I got to touch on that for just a second, okay? I'll, I'll do so carefully. That God gave them over to the lusts of their hearts. So we're going to use big, big person words here that the impurity that we're speaking of, is that what you're thinking? That's what you are thinking impurity means. The relationship that only a husband and wife who are married to each other should have. And so, the impurity that, think about that for a second. That impurity comes first with temptation, with a driving lust in our hearts, the lust of their hearts to strive after that impurity. And trust me, if I, I'm not going to attack the men, but trust me, if you're a man 
and you have blood in your veins, you know exactly what this is speaking of. You're driving towards the lust of your heart. And so before your relationship with Christ, you, you wanted that more than anything else. Or I did. So that our bodies would be di- so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. Verse twenty five, for they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. So here they have the truth of God. They don't want it. They don't want the truth, and so they exchange it for a lie. They would rather believe a lie than to have to come to the realization that the truth. Is, in, is, is God, is God's word. They exchange the truth of God's word. They exchange the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, and here we have our, our fifth, that, that fifth kind of, of wrath, the wrath of abandonment. The removing restraint of God's grace. God is is removing his grace and allowing sin, allowing the people to go after their sin. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. So remember what verse 24 said. God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. For their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. Okay? Think about that for a minute. What is the natural function of women? And he starts there because that is how far depraved they have, they have become. Because it's normally focused on just the men. It's, it's apparent. It's more apparent in the men. But they've come so far that it is start. He, he, he starts with the women. Their degrading passions for their women exchange for the natural function for that which is unnatural. We're all adults here. We all understand. Well, we all understand what that means. In the same way, also, the men abandon the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another, men with men, committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. Now, hear me. I know, I know people, I know, I know men that burn with lustful desires towards other men. And They are very wrong in doing so. But that lust that is, it, it is burning towards other men is wrong because God has created man to be with woman. It's, it, goes, it stems all the way back to creation. Why? What, why, does, why is man and woman, why are those two supposed to be together? It represents the relationship of Jesus Christ and his church. So if you have a, a husband and a wife, the husband represents Christ, the wife represents the church. It is God's model or or his representation of himself 
in the relationship between a husband and his wife. So it would be an abomination of God's creation and of, of Christ's relationship with the church if men burn for men. And they're committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. So that, that takes us up to the consequential wrath. So we have STDs. We have AIDS. We have death and eternal separation from God because they're suppressing the truth and they are believing the lie that it is genetic, that, that God made them that way. God didn't make them that way. They... They're, but they believe that. And, and all of the psychology and, and, and psychologists and, and science that, that has been poured into trying to prove that, that that type of lifestyle is hereditary or is natural is, is wrong. I was listening to Alistair Begg on this, and he said he brought up somebody that that was also a a uh, scientist, and and sh- and she said, and that there is no way to prove that that is natural. That, in a matter of fact, there you cannot prove that it is genetically passed, or that it is a it is something that they are born with, that, that they, and so that goes completely against everything that, that, that the world is saying. It's, it's a choice. It's a choice to live that way. And there's only one person that can take the lust that a man is having for another man and turn that around, and that is Jesus Christ. We can't do that for them. And, and we might be stuck in difficult situations if we, are, if we have them in our lives. It, it is a very difficult situation. Um, because... We want to honor God. We don't want to, uh, you know, hate that person because of their, their life choices. You know, we want, we long for them to see, to, to see the relationship that they could have with Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of their sins and eternal life. We don't want them to go on living their, their wicked lifestyle. And, and so that, that sin is, is an example of all the other sins that, pe- that people chase after. Which one is worse? Is, is it the abomination of that lifestyle because it misrepresents Jesus Christ in the church? Well, what if I... I'm lusting after other women, and I'm married, and I'm lusting after other women. Doesn't that, isn't that an abomination between the representation of Christ and his church? Because Jesus loves his church in a particular way. And he gave his life, suffered God's wrath for the salvation of the church. Does he love the world? Yes. But he has this distinct love for his church. So 
I don't want you to think that I'm drilling down on and, and saying that, that that is the only sin. That is not the only sin. We, we, we want to lovingly bring those people who struggle with those addictions and with those lifestyles, we want to lovingly bring them into a relationship, lovingly bring them into repentance. Sometimes you have to take that down different avenues. Sometimes you got to shut them out and hope that, you know, if it goes too far, you got to shut them out and, and, and leave, you know, ultimately pray. And, and you're still praying when you're with them. But the Holy Spirit is stronger than we are. And, and we can trust that the Holy Spirit will, you know, I, I pray for my unsaved family members every night that God would bring them into repentance and in a right relationship with them. And do I shut them out of my life? Sometimes. But I don't shut them out permanently. If, if they call me, send me a text, I answer it. But I'm not going to partake in that kind of lifestyle with them. I'm not going to, to indulge, you know, I'm still going to separate myself from that. And hope, and hope that, that God convicts them in such a way that he destroys everything around them in precatory, in precatory prayer, that God would destroy everything around them so that they would see him and him alone. All right, I'll move on. 28. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over. Here we go again. God gave them over his wrath. You know, he's, so he's pulling his grace away and letting them go into their sin. He gives them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wicked, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, Malice, they are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. Now, if, if we're talking about character, and let's say that you are trying to build a resume or something and you want to give, you know, list some characteristics about yourself that would put you, that would make you a, you know, a good candidate for this position. Well, I am unrighteous. I'm wicked. I'm greedy. I'm evil. No, you know, th these things are very serious sin. The very serious characteristics. It's not a, it's not a, a exhaustive list, but it is a. It, it includes a lot of characteristics that are sinful, and so it's it's a good checklist for us. You know, are we are we full of envy? Are we greedy? Are we arrogant? Do we boast? Are we inventors of evil? Are we disobedient to our parents? Do we gossip? And I would lie to you if I said that I didn't do those things. But, but like I said, those things are things that I don't want to do. I hate doing them. And it should lead us to, into repentance and seeing the grace of God through Jesus Christ.
I don't wake up in the morning and say, you know what? I want to be malicious today. You know what? I'm going to be the most boastful person I can be today. No. I, but but we, we tend to slip once in a while. And so the Holy Spirit convicts us, breaks us, and leads us to repentance and, and, and love in Jesus Christ. All right, wrap this up real quick. Uh, verse 32. And although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but they also give hearty approval to those who practice them. We don't have to dig very far for that today. That those who give hearty approval to those who practice these things, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not, aren't, they not only do the same, so they're not only doing them, but they're also cheering the people on that are, that are doing it. So they, they, want, they want people to live that sinful lifestyle, and so they're encouraging them, hey, go ahead and, and sin. Go ahead. You know what? Abortion is it's it's a woman's choice it's it's a piece it's a part of the woman's body go ahead you know and i I pray that god's grace would reach out and touch those people that that have either had an abortion or thinking about an abortion or or giving hearty approval of abortions i wish i i pray that god would would reach out, break their hearts so that they would see exactly what they are doing and that they would know it. But they could be resisting that, that the, the, or suppressing, I mean, they, they could be suppressing the truth and unrighteousness so much that their hearts are being darkened. So let's turn back to verse 16 one more time. Verse 1, or sorry, chapter 1, verse 16. Where Paul states, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It reminds me that the, the whole, this whole sin, this whole study on sin has, has brought me to... I think it was Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9 with the woman and the hemorrhage. She was... Yeah, Luke chapter 9, verse 40. And as Jesus returned, the people welcomed him, for they had been waiting for him. And there came a man named Jairus, and he was an official of the synagogue. And he fell at Jesus' feet and began to implore him to come to his house. For he had an only daughter, about 12 years old, and she was dying. But as he went, the crowds were pressing against him. So these crowds are coming, they're pressing him. And a woman who had hemorrhage, had a hemorrhage for 12 years and could not be healed by anyone, came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak, and immediately her hemorrhage stopped. What would a hemorrhage do to a Jew or to a person living in a Jewish culture, it would make them so unclean that they can't be around anybody else because if they, if anybody else touches her blood, they become unclean. Well, she's hemorrhaging and she's been hemorrhaging for 12 years. They don't have, you can't just go take a shower and wash your clothes. Like you can't go throw it in the washing machine. She's hemorrhaging. Okay. Blood, blood's everywhere. She's unclean. And so people are not wanting to be around her, but she's in this crowd where people are pressing against Jesus and she comes to Jesus and touches him. And immediately her hemorrhage stopped. Let that be a visual of the repentance and the, and the healing that comes through repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. She didn't just come to Jesus because it was a, a fluke or by chance. She was going to the one where she believed could heal her. 
And so anybody that is living that lifestyle that, we were, that I was talking about can come to Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ will not turn them away. He is the only one that can save them. And that goes for any other sin. If we're, if anybody that's struggling with sin, anybody that needs to be saved will not be turned away. Jesus Christ will spiritually heal them. Let me pray and we'll I'll close in, in the prayer.